Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Clandaff Cathedral. Uh, my name is Jordan Hilbert, and I'm the Director of Formation at St. Patarns Institute, the Training Institute uh, for the Church in Wales. And on behalf of the Cathedral team here, it is my joy to welcome you to this evening's conversation with Rowan Williams. Uh, this evening, evening's event is, of course, the first of many wonderful events that have been planned for this week uh, for this year's Clandaff Cathedral Festival. So for the next few days, the cathedral will be hosting a lineup of exciting guest speakers, musicians, poets, workshops, and family events. And so I encourage everyone to visit the Clendaff Cathedral Festival website uh, for more details. Our evening's conversation partner requires uh, very little by way of introduction. Bishop Rowan Williams is an accomplished theologian, poet, and playwright. He was recently Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, and before that served as Bishop of Monmouth, Archbishop of the Church in Wales, and of course the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury. Bishop Rowan has held academic posts at both Cambridge and Oxford, and is easily one of the most influential theologians in the English-speaking world. His writing covers an impressive array of interests related to Christian thought, worship, and practice, as well as literature, philosophy of language, political theory, uh, et cetera, et cetera. His recent works include Looking East in Winter, The Way of St. Benedict, and Being Human, Bodies, Minds, Persons. When Bishop Rowan is not writing books or speaking at events such as this one, uh, you can often find him covering services in churches in and around Cardiff, uh, for which I'm sure Bishop Mary and the Archdeacons uh, are greatly appreciative. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Bishop Rowan Williams to this evening's conversation. Well, Bishop Rowan, we are meeting this evening in uh, the magnificent Clandaff Cathedral, a site of Christian uh, prayer and praise and worship uh, for more than 1,500 years. Can you say something to us about how you understand the unique vocation of a cathedral, um, so both in the life of the diocese and in relationship mm -hmm. to society more generally? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here and for your introduction. And just before answering, let me say that we, we withdrew our chairs here, not out of anxiety about infection from COVID or anything, <laughs> but just so that we could see a few more of you. It does, it does help. Um, what's a cathedral for? Well, it's, of course, to give the bishop somewhere to sit. <laughs> and that's not insignificant, because the role of a bishop, as we all know, is not simply that of a chief executive. The role of a bishop is to be the celebrant of the Christian sacraments in an area who draws into her or his fellowship to celebrate those sacraments all those who share pastoral ministry and teaching responsibility. So that's where it starts. The bishop as the person who gathers the Christian community to celebrate, and it helps to have a good space for that to happen in. This is quite a good space as spaces go. And that means that those who sustain the regular work and worship of a cathedral, because bishops are here, there, and everywhere a lot of the time, those who sustain the regular pattern have a very particular responsibility to, let's put it very simply, to look as if they know what they're doing in worship, to do it with confidence, to do it with well, let's say simply with style, to do it in a way that conveys to all God's people the impression that the worship of God is one of the most significant, life-giving, enriching things we could possibly imagine. So, uh, no pressure, Mr. Dean. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also part of the point of a cathedral. Yes, it's where the bishop celebrates but bishops, as I say, have to be around and about. So the cathedral, the bishop's seat, needs to sustain that rhythm of credible, nourishing worship. And because St. Paul says, I will sing with the spirit, but I will sing with the understanding also, 
Cathedrals from very early on have been centres of teaching as well, which doesn't mean getting the odd person in for a lecture now and then. It does mean that, again, there's a responsibility for those who are regularly sustaining the life of a cathedral community to make sure that the credibility of Christian faith includes the life of the mind as well as the, the emotions of the heart and the delight of the eyes and ears. So that's where I'd start in thinking about cathedrals. And it's really interesting, as a lot of you know, that in recent years, attendance in cathedrals over many areas of the UK has risen, I think partly because a lot of people have a high expectation of both of those things, a credible and nourishing life of worship a credible and nourishing life of the mind. And, well, people are enriched by that. They feel their horizons are enlarged by it. And the very last thing I'd want to say about that, I think, is that it's that enlargement of horizons that is one of the important aspects of the way in which a cathedral houses and embodies the ministry of the bishop. One reason for having bishops in the church, apart from having, you've got to, got to have somebody to do the confirmations, one reason for having bishops in the church is that the bishop is a kind of gateway between the local church and the universal church. A good bishop is somebody who brings universal perspectives to bear on local Christian communities, but also mediates, interprets, communicates the grassroots life of the local community to the wider community. And cathedrals stand in the same place. They are there to be homely places for the Christian communities of the diocese, really connected with and listening to those grassroots. And they're there to open doors of imagination and inspiration to the wider church. So, sorry to mm, wrap no. it on, but that, that, you know, that's where I think I'd start mm. defining the, the role of a cathedral, which, which is really exciting. Mm. How about the unique kind of missional opportunities of, uh, of a cathedral? Yeah. So I, I think it's safe to say a place like this might get more foot traffic than your average village church. You have uh, pilgrims coming to cathedrals, you have tourists coming to cathedrals, people encountering the, the symbols of the mm. faith for the first time. Uh, how does a cathedral meet those seekers where they are? I've been very impressed visiting some cathedrals that have really thought through what it's like to guide a visitor through a building. There's a journey to be taken. You just, just come in through that door, look around and say, oh, architecture, and then go and look for a tea shop. You try to lead people through a building, through the different kinds of intellectual and emotional impressions and effects that a building may have, and make the most of it. There's a cathedral in southern Sweden, Linköping, where there was a brilliantly insightful and spiritual bishop some years ago, Martin Lüneber. And Bishop Lüneber, created a kind of pilgrimage walk through this rather splendid medieval cathedral by setting semi-precious stones in the floor at intervals with an area around them. And it was like a kind of rosary laid out on the floor. There were different prayers and different topics for meditation at each point around the building. And you could purchase in the cathedral shop a little rosary of small stones on which you could remember these different themes and perspectives that had taken you around the cathedral. I thought that was wonderful. I, I walked around the cathedral with some Swedish friends and I could see how visitors to the cathedral were, as it were, slowed down and rooted as they walked around. And that seemed to be a, a really wonderful approach. And there are different ways you can do that in different buildings because most cathedrals do have 
different sorts of space in them where different things happen, different aspects of the faith are commemorated. And um, as you'll be aware, there's, there's a cathedral in Canterbury where I spent a bit of time, and um, one of the better bits of the job. I can't remember what the other one was now. <laughs> um, but the thing about Canterbury is you have such different spaces. You've got a big light nave, you've got a very dark, mysterious, and prayerful crypt, you've got the old shrine area up at the far end, far east end of the cathedral, you've got steps up and down, you've got all sorts of perspectives, and it cries out for a carefully, what's the word they use now, curated walk through these different spaces to open up different spaces inside you. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I thought we might walk down memory lane a bit um, uh, and ask a few questions about kind of childhood, teenage years, and, and some of your formative influences. Mm. Um, so first, thinking back on, on your upbringing, what books challenged you, inspired you, or shaped your imagination growing up? Mm. Big question. <laughs> um, Dr. Seuss or... You know, his... <laughs> I didn't get to that in my 20s. <laughs> I, I was, oh dear, I was a very sad child, really. I, I loved books and read obsessively. And I remember finding in my, I think my grandmother's library, two books which I really took to at quite an early age. One was an old copy of the Mabinogion, and the other was the Pilgrim's Progress. And yes, of course, I, I read all sorts of other children's books too, but those two made quite an impact. And reading the Mabinogion gave me a, a lifelong fascination with folklore, with mythology, which still persists, and the Pilgrim's Progress, which of course I didn't really understand at all when I was nine or 10, did at least convey the idea that the life of faith was well, as some people put it, not just a walk in the park. Mm. And although all those long passages in The Pilgrim's Progress about theological debates and so forth and the rather heavy-handed satire <laughs> passed me by, there was, there is, an enormous energy and excitement in John Bunyan's prose, which I think communicated itself even to a, a small boy. And then in secondary school, I guess, discovering, especially getting ready for O level, discovering some of the great English poetic tradition, that really opened, opened the doors for me to engage more with poetry, which again has been a lifelong interest. So um, Yes, that, that's where it started, and I, I have a huge debt to the people who, so to speak, sat alongside me, not just my family, but some wonderful teachers in my secondary school in Swansea, and as I've often said, an absolutely wonderful parish priest, Eddie Hughes, in All Saints Oysternoth in Swansea, who was willing to spend quite a long time answering questions, posing questions, lending books, just, I suppose, taking seriously the questions that you brought to him. And I can remember at Eddie's funeral, oh, some nearly 30 years ago now, somebody I'd been in the choir with as a teenager who was there at the funeral, saying to me afterwards, I hope we have somebody who can be for our children what Eddie was for us. And that wasn't just a good priest, it was also a grown-up who listened, like a good godparent, or a slightly mad aunt, you know, sort of, that's never what you ought to have in their family somewhere. And Eddie, I think, set me a, a standard of priestly vision and behavior which remains, yes, my ideal. So, so picking up on John Bunyan and the way in which literature can 
really kind of form us and help us to inhabit the Christian faith. Can you think of any recent or modern or even contemporary authors' literary works that you think provide an especially compelling vision of the Christian faith, kind of something of its beauty and its mm, strangeness? Mm. One obvious instance in very recent writing, I suppose, would be the novels of Marilyn Robinson, the American writer. You, you'll know her, her work. For those of you who don't know Marilyn Robinson's work, she's, um, she's a Presbyterian, um, very much a, a North, North American, you know, rather austere, not, not one of your Southern writers. And she wrote this sequence of books set in a little town, I suppose it's on the borders of Kansas, isn't it? Is that so Idaho or is it? No, so it might be Kansas. It's somewhere, mm. you know, mm. kind of lost Midwest. Midwest, or, somewhere, yes. The flyover states, mm. as they say. Um, Gilead. And the first book in the sequence is called Gilead. And it's about, basically, it's about the family life of an elderly congregationalist pastor. And you think, what could be a less exciting subject <laughs> with due respect to any congregationalists present. <laughs> Yet, it's a book which grabbed the imagination of so many people because, as some reviewers said, it made goodness interesting. Here was a man flawed and struggling in many ways, but returning steadily and seriously to the question of Where's the center? Where's the center of gravity? And part of, the, part of the book is about this old minister's unlikely marriage to a very, very unconventional young woman, Lila. And they have a son. And Lila appears in this book, a, almost a sort of marginal character, but always making you scratch your head of it. How on earth? Did this devout old soul marry this rather wild young woman? And as the sequence unfolds, two other perspectives come into the story. The second book in the sequence, which is called Home, is about another minister in the same time, a Presbyterian this time, and his family troubles. And you meet his son, Jack, who is um, the godson of the minister of the first book. The third book is Lila, and it's the story of this young woman and what has made her who she is and what she is. And the fourth book in the sequence is called Jack, and it's about the young man, the son of the Presbyterian minister. So what is it about these books that, that's so compelling? It's not just about goodness, because, as somebody said, commenting on the books, they're also books about how goodness is not enough. These quiet, rather undramatic characters in this quiet Midwestern town are also, whether they know it or not, caught up in the turmoil of the 50s and 60s. And the issue of race is actually a strong subtext all the way through. And you gradually sense, especially by the end of the second book, this is a community that thinks it's nice, but cannot cope with the systemic injustice and the exclusivism, which it takes, it can't cope, can't do anything with that. It can't move beyond it. Niceness is not quite enough. And the role of Lila, the minister's wife in this, is almost come as a prophetic challenge to this nice little community. And at the end of the book that bears her name, she has not a quarrel, but a really sort of tense few moments, few weeks, with her husband. Because she wants to say, she has arrived at a place of security and welcome of a sort. She's married to this lovely old man. She's got a little boy. But her experience is an experience of poverty, abuse, homelessness, 
dramatic displacement and suffering. And along the way, she's been helped and nurtured by a whole range of very, very unlikely people. Murderers and prostitutes among them. And she says to her husband on the last but one page, I paraphrase, but it's something like this, you know, if God wants me in heaven, he'll have to let me let all these other people in with me. Because they're the people who've made me what I am. I can't be there without mm. them. And that caused quite a bit of theological um, throat clearing in the United mm. States, as it might in many contexts. Mm. But it's part of the, the force of the book and why, why this sequence of books is such a wonderful set of reflections on the real tough heartland of Christian belief and, mm. and practice. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could talk a lot about Marilyn Robinson. She's also a wonderful essayist. She's written a lot about um, contemporary culture and its problems, especially American culture. She's written a brilliant little book called Absence of Mind, which ought really now to be dusted off because now we're having more debates about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Marilyn and Robinson's reflections on the nature of mind are amazingly pertinent. She's spotted some of the real problems about our love affair with artificial intelligence and what it's doing to us. So utterly brilliant and slightly terrifying person. I've got to know her over the last 15 years and um, I'm still deeply in awe of her and one of those people who as soon as you open your mouth without her saying anything you feel do I really need to say this I sound so stupid <laughs> and shallow compared with her <laughs> but a great presence a sort of um, mother of the church I think in our day well as it's the fourth of July I think it's rather fitting that you pointed us to a great American author tonight Rowan that's that's excellent um, well, actually, picking up on your reflections on All Saints and, and the role that that had in, in, in kind of mm. your introduction to the faith and, and, and really inhabiting that mm. faith as a, as a child, uh, what initially drew you to the Anglican Church? Because am I right that as a, as a young child, you're, you, both of your parents were Presbyterian? That's right, yes. yes. Um, so what brought the family to the Anglican Church? What led you in particular? Mm. Yes, well, I, I acknowledge my debt here to Park End Presbyterian mm. across the city here. Um, in its glory days in the 1950s with the ministry of Geraint Mantlois Williams, a very great preacher. And um, I think had we not moved to Swansea when I was 11, I might well still be a Presbyterian, which would have saved me a lot of trouble. <laughs> but there we are. Um, but we did move. And there wasn't a Presbyterian church very near us, and so we explored a little bit. And strange as it may sound, this rather Anglo-Catholic parish church felt more like Park End Presbyterian than anywhere else. It was something to do with the quality of the preaching. It was something to do with the real sort of care and imagination that was used in involving young people in the life of the church. It was something to do with the personality of the pastor. And all of that, as well as for me, the discovery of um, the church year and the ritual of the church, the sacramental life, mm. and all that went with it, and the musical tradition. I joined the choir very early. Um, all of that kind of came together. And looking back, I think of those two communities, Park End and All Saints, as having helped to form the two lungs I breathe with, you might mm. say. Mm. And again, something I've often said, in my teens, having somebody like Eddie as a parish priest meant that it always felt as though Christianity was big enough to take anything you threw at it. There was no sense that this was a, a defensive little system that was always anxiously trying to stop you thinking difficult thoughts or asking awkward questions. On the contrary, there was a feeling 
Well, yes, that's interesting. Let's see where that can live within this Christian space. So all through my teens, I kept you know, discovering new things about politics, literature, um, society. And at every turn, it seemed, there was, there was room for it in the kind of Christian mm -hmm. imagination that I was being nurtured in. And that's something I'm abidingly grateful for because I know it's not everybody's experience of uh, church when they're teenagers, mm -hmm. or indeed other ages. <laughs> Throughout the 20th century, we see kind of a number of attempts to resuscitate what was seen as kind of long neglected doctrines. So we have Bart and Rahner trying to revitalize Trinitarian theology. We have this focused attention on eschatology after the wars. Um, we have renewed attention to the, the Holy Spirit, thanks in part to the rise of Pentecostalism and, and charismatic expressions of Christianity. Um, I was wondering if, uh, kind of what your thoughts on, are, are there aspects of the Christian faith that you think are uh, neglected today and that could do with a bit of renewed attention? Hmm. I guess that if I were trying to identify one area of Christian theology where I thought we needed more and more careful work, it would be what in the trade is called anthropology, the doctrine of the human. You kindly mentioned I'd written a book called Being Human, which is really just a collection of, um, of talks on a subject which really demands a much, much more careful exposition. But we're just thinking of conversations simply in the last couple of weeks. Um, I was at a conference the week before last, um, associated with a little research group I've been part of, which has been looking at the implications of artificial intelligence for theology and spirituality. And this conference, which included a number of quite senior computer scientists and a couple of philosophers and a couple of theologians, this conference kept on coming back to the question, so what is it that fundamentally makes us human? And if artificial intelligence is particularly good at winning chess games and writing A-level essays, <laughs> those being the two most important things we could think of, <laughs> um, what's left for us? And a lot of people, I think, in one way or another, are asking questions a bit like that. Now, the Christian doctrine of what it is to be human begins with the confident and quite unlikely affirmation that to be human is to be made in the image of God. And that doesn't mean that humans are a bit like God, because in all sorts of important ways they're not at all like God. But the image of God, well, an image is always in relation to its prototype. Your image in the mirror is there because you're there. To be in the image of God means we're here because God is. So there's something about our humanity which is always, consciously or not, turning towards the infinity the mystery, the love of God. So to be human, putting it in very, very basic terms, and lots that could be said, to be human is to be sort of oriented towards that mystery, that question. And that extends right across the range of humanity, wherever and whoever. It's true of the newborn baby, it's true of the sand tribesmen in sub-Saharan Africa. It's true of the Regis Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. It's true of the homeless man on the corner by Tesco. All of those are turned towards this mystery of love. They are all, therefore, worthy of the deepest attention and the most consistent care. 
because our duty to one another becomes a duty to release and uncover in one another that capacity for love and relationship. We talk about human rights, and fine, that, that's not a bad thing to do, especially these days. But human rights means nothing if it's not about releasing that capacity to relate, to create, to connect. And the real work of liberation in our world is releasing one another's humanity because everyone's humanity has that magnetic turn towards God. And therefore, it's all to be taken seriously. Now, that's I say, the theological basis on which I think Christians talk about what it is to be human. And that's where lots of interesting questions arise about the nature of human intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a wonderful system for solving specific problems. But as lots of people who work a lot with it will agree, our intelligence, our human intelligence, is not just about solving problems. Our human intelligence is about building connections. Our human intelligence is about seeing patterns that aren't just mechanical. Our human intelligence is about what we learn with our bodies as well as our minds. Our human intelligence helps us to play the cello or the ukulele. Our human intelligence is about riding a bicycle. Our human intelligence is about recognizing that it's your baby who's crying at the other end of the hall. Now, AI is brilliant at chess games and A-level essays, but to be honest, it's not terribly good at any of those. And that's something to do with the fact that AI isn't organic. It doesn't taste or smell or see or hear. It processes condensed, translated information that we feed into it. And it does wonderful, miraculous things with that. But that's not quite how we work. And I think getting clearer about that not quite how we work dimension is something which Christian theologians ought to be piling in with, with some enthusiasm and some confidence. And I worry about a, a culture which is so overawed by the, the surface cleverness of AI that it thinks that's the only kind of intelligence that counts. And there's the real problem. I don't, to be honest, lose very much sleep about the idea that artificial intelligence is going to take over the world and make us its servants, the science fiction <coughs> scenario. And most of my computer scientist friends agree with that. I do worry about the way in which we learn to value certain kinds of intelligence at the expense of certain other kinds. There's a real problem there. So, sorry, long answer to No, that's that. very that's helpful. I suppose the, the flip side to that, one of the benefits, I suppose, of artificial intelligence is it kind of forces us to rediscover our own creatureliness in some ways as well. The, exactly, yes. Kind of what we share in common with, with the other creatures with which we're in, interdependently related. And, that, that's a very good way of putting it. I think that's exactly on the ball. Um, it helps us to reconnect with the fact that in the very best sense, we are animals. And it's fine to be an animal. <laughs> That's what we are. We are embodied intelligences that feed and reproduce and learn in a bodily way. And that means that we're not somehow an isolated species which occasionally takes a walk around the supermarket to get what it needs and exploit it and destroy it. It means we are, as you say, profoundly connected with a whole material world in which we're always receiving and transmitting information and nourishment. 
A friend of mine wrote a book some years ago in which he suggested that, being very provocative, we needed to think that eating was a form of intelligence. Eating as a form of intelligence. Now, when I read that for the first time, I reacted as many of you may have reacted, saying, pardon? But what he meant was, when we eat, our bodies receive messages. Our food knows what to do in our bodies and where to go. It changes us, and we change it. And that's how intelligence works. We change the world, it changes us. The world gives us information which affects how our bodies work. And things like eating and breathing are a very special kind of receiving information. Mm. So it's all intelligence. Mm. And it's all connected. It's, if you want to be biblical, it's the wisdom of God at work. Mm. That wisdom which, as Scripture says, gently pervades everything. Well, picking up on that theme of anthropology and actually eating as well, <laughs> uh, one of the things I've greatly benefited from in your work is this uh, very sympathetic reading of Christian asceticism uh, and ascetical theology. So thinking back to your, your work on the Desert Fathers and Mothers, uh, y your recent work on the Philokalia, um, and I think it's fair to say that Christian asceticism has had a, a great deal of bad press over the last few decades. So it's seen as being so heavenly minded that we are mm. of no earthly use or being overly negative about our mm. bodies mm. and our embodied experiences. Mm. Uh, what do you see as the positive role that asceticism can and mm. should play in the life of faith? Mm. Well, first of all, I think in the interest of full disclosure, um, quite a bit of the Christian tradition has got it wrong about asceticism because it's so temptingly easy to say, I will do something so spectacularly sacrificial that God will be deeply impressed. <laughs> and there is a strand of our Christian identity which keeps, as it were, slipping back to that idea, I've got to impress God. Now, when we stop for a moment and think what we're saying, that is the most dramatic kind of nonsense you could imagine. God is not going to be impressed by anything we do. Because the God who made us, who lives beyond and within us, the God whose action sustains every moment of our lives, you know, that God is not an audience for our performance. And it's trivial and almost blasphemous to think that God is. Okay, so what is the, the positive here? What I think many of the early uh, monks of the desert, for example, were trying to do was something a bit more like this. How far do you depend on the habits that make you comfortable? Let's find out. Can you carry on being yourself effectively, humanly, if you do without this or that aspect of ordinary human gratification? Let's find out. Because that does begin to tell you, in Jesus' words, where your heart is. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your sense of yourself is wrapped up in or stuck glued to certain kinds of habits, certain kinds of satisfaction, you are just that little bit less than you might be. So let's find out. And what's so interesting about some of the um, stories of the great early saints of the desert is that there's both a strong emphasis on asceticism and self-denial and a really rather startling relativity about it at the same time. So we read that, I think it's St. Macarius, one of the great desert saints, a great ascetic who would eat just once a day and subsisted on mostly on bread and water. When visitors came, he would drink wine, have a full meal with them, send them, send them on their way. 
no problem, because St. Macarius knew perfectly well, A, that he could manage without his wine and his sausages, and B, that it was an act of generosity to share the pleasure of the people he was with. And this slightly scandalized some of the more narrow-minded monks, who said, well, surely your first duty is to keep your discipline. And Macarius said, well, the real discipline is to, to listen to what God is sending you and saying to you, and not to set yourself apart in a kind of elitist way. And for that matter, it's all there in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, isn't it? All of that is there. If you want to deny yourself, fine. But don't think that makes you better than somebody else. Don't think it gives you a right to tell somebody else how to do it all. You're responding to what you think God's call is. Great. Respect what the other person experiences as the call of God. And that's very much there in the early sayings of the Desert Fathers. So I think asceticism is about looking at how deeply you're glued to your habits. Which is why when people say they're giving up social media for Lent, I think they've got the point about asceticism. Mm. And they, I, I'm not a social media man myself, <laughs> you might have guessed, but I do get a sense of how difficult that might be for mm -hmm. those who do try that. Mm. So keeping with the, the theme of spirituality, what does prayer mean to you? And do you have any tips for us on establishing and maintaining a healthy prayer life, a flourishing prayer life? One of the best definitions I know of prayer is a line from the 17th century poet George Herbert's sonnet on prayer. The breath of God returning to its birth. The breath of God returning to its birth. Remember what I said about not impressing God? Well, the same with prayer. Prayer is not sending a message from here to there. God is alive in me and around me. And when I pray, I'm trying to make room for the activity of God to well up back towards its source. I'm trying to let the God within and the God beyond connect. And look at me now, <laughs> isn't it interesting that w when we pray, we do mm. connect. And people who practice certain kinds of particularly Eastern meditation will often say that this posture where hand is touching hand is a very good symbol of what's going on. Is this hand touching this hand or is this hand touching this hand? There's no answer, is there? But what happens is they come together. And in prayer, it's the life of the spirit within pouring through the life of the everlasting Son, Christ, towards the mystery of the Father, coming together. Now, I think that's, that's the very heart of prayer. And so when when I give thanks to God, it's an attempt to let the richness of the gifts that God has given be reflected back to the giver. When I pray for a situation or a person, it's trying to open my mind and my heart to what God most deeply wants for that person or situation. And a lot of the time, it's simply a matter of breathing in silence, aware of the movement of God through that silence. And as to tips, the, uh, the bad news, as you might say, is that you do have to make some resolutions and make them work. You do have to eat your greens. You do have to make the time. And to make that time, you need to have something to lean on. And when you're finding your way, it helps a lot to have 
even if it's a very limited little pattern of how to approach it. Again, looking back to um, the formation I had as a teenager, I was brought up on that um, hoary formula that prayer is about acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And that's what I think of, that's a handhold. You know, you can hang on to that. It's one way of structuring it. The offices of morning and evening prayer are another kind of handhold. Here is the recitation of the Psalms, the listening to the Bible, the recognition of your dependence and hope and gratitude, and it's, it's a structure. And when you've got used to that sort of structure, and it may be a very, very simple pattern, it gradually opens out if you let it. You can find that perhaps the words begin to fall away a bit. You take the rather risky step of leaving the gaps of silence that slowly increase. And you learn a little bit about sitting, breathing, looking, being there before God. And um, one of the analogies I've sometimes used for that is that it's a bit like a sun lamp. You, know, you turn it on, you lie down, you're not quite sure how it's all working, and if you keep getting up to see how it's going and how the tan is coming on, then actually it's not going to work. You just have to sit and be there and let God get at you. But to get to that point, you do need, do need these handholds, these basic bits of structure, I think. And it helps to be using words that have meant something to other people across the centuries. Mm. I noticed you're speaking on Saturday about uh, the Jesus prayer. And uh, can you say something to us mm. about the significance of that prayer in your, in your own spiritual life? Yes but also why that's been such a valuable tool in the church's mm. uh, toolkit. Well, for those who have not come across it, the so-called prayer of Jesus is a technique particularly used by Eastern Orthodox Christians. Um, and the first evidence of its use seems to be, or something like it, seems to be somewhere around the sixth century. It's simply reciting the formula, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So it takes the prayer of the tax collector in Luke's Gospel, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and just elaborates it a little. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's very much one of those handhold prayers. Sometimes it's good to find a, a formula you can repeat. It can be that. It can be, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It can be Jesus, lover of my soul. It can be any number of things. But that, that formula has a long history in the Eastern Church. And traditionally, you, you use it in connection with a, a prayer rope, which is just a, well, what it says on the tin. It's a hundred little woolen knots in a string. And you simply say the formula while letting these little knots pass through your fingers. If you say it slowly, if you breathe in silently and then just let the formula out as you breathe out, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, quietly or aloud, then a hundred of those is about 20 to 30 minutes. And that's a very common practice in Eastern Orthodox monasteries. Now, I first read about that, I think, as a teenager, when I began to be very interested in the life of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And um, I can only say that I, I tried it out and didn't stop. <laughs> so it remains, in one way or another, very basic for me. And you can vary the formula, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner is the standard. Along with many people I find, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit is a good alternative. 
the fuller form that sometimes used in the Orthodox Church, holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. You can vary it, but to recite that quietly, steadily, that is a way of slowing down the metabolism a bit, quite literally. Your heartbeat slows after a while, it really does. And as your heartbeat slows, then your brain waves begin to look a bit different. They're less kind of, and more level. <laughs> a few years ago, um, I had a colleague in Cambridge, a very bright young neurophysicist, who was doing some work on consciousness. And she wrote a very accessible little book on neuroscience. And she was invited to speak at the Hay Festival about this book. And because we used to chat over lunch in college quite a bit, she said, why don't we do this together? And when I got to the Hay Festival and um, Hannah and I were on the stage, Hannah said, what I'm going to do is to measure your brainwaves, brainwaves while you're meditating. <laughs> so she said, in front of 700 odd people, I want you to sit there and meditate, and I'm going to <laughs> wire you up and demonstrate what your brainwaves look like <laughs> when you're meditating. <laughs> um, rather bizarre exercise. There is a photograph somewhere, which I'm trying to get suppressed. <laughs> but it is true that if you are meditating, there's not, nothing kind of mystical or magical about it. It simply slows your heartbeat, circulation of the blood, and levels your brain activity. And all of that by quietening what Buddhists wonderfully call the monkey mind, the mind that leaps around from branch to branch, chattering wildly. Anything that calms that down just makes a bit more room for God. Which brings us back to the kind of embodied nature of the spiritual life. Very it's much It's so. not Very the intellect so. operating in isolation. Yep. But, yep. Mm. Uh, so in my line of work, uh, working with ministerial candidates, we often speak of uh, you know, vocation, calling, and, and I think it's good and right that we do. But I think tragically the church often only speaks about vocation in terms of licensed and ordained ministry. Uh, but of course, everyone has a unique calling or vocation from God, a, a role to play in God's great story of redemption. Uh, so I suppose the, the question to you is not just for those in ministry, but for all of us, uh, what does it look like to discern one's vocation? Uh, you would be surprised if I say there's no um, silver bullet answer to this. But discerning a vocation, I've often thought, is above all discerning who you are. It's not that God looks at you and says, oh, there's a promising character, I think I might want them to be a priest. It's much more that God has made you a person with particular gifts and concerns, capacities and wounds as well, all of which give you certain kinds of ability to tune in to the world in certain ways. And understanding a bit how that works, understanding the person that your experience has made you is the beginning of discernment. So it's not just sort of, sort of kneeling on a hard stone floor and saying to God, tell me what to do. Um, it'd be nice if it worked that way, but it really doesn't very much. It's often much more a case of, and you've heard this as I've heard it, um, the sort of person who says, I woke up and realized I had, to, I had to take a step and offer myself for this. I don't know quite why, but this seemed to make sense. Mm. And, well, you, you'll know from conversations with people preparing for ministry, mm. the very different ways in which that happens and the way in which people realize to be myself in the presence of God takes me in that direction. But as soon as you've said that, of course, you realize that there can't just be one answer to that question of who I am and what I'm, what I'm there mm. for. And, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's still true that vocation is the business of every Christian for the very simple reason that the whole idea of the church 
is the idea of a community that is called or invited. The Greek word ecclesia means the convocation, the people who've been called together. And that's not a bad definition of church, the people who've been called together. God invites everybody to the divine life, the divine feast, the company of the Holy Trinity. God invites everyone. And everyone comes, if they respond to the invitation, with their own capacities and their own concerns and, as I say, their own injuries and failures too. Because one of the things you do learn in short order in ordained ministry is that your failures matter at least as much as anything else. Because those are the moments where you learn that there isn't a formula, that you're not God, a quite important recognition, and a very liberating one, where you learn that you always have to start again and that God is always there for you to start again with. And that recognition of failure, individually and collectively in the church, ought to be one of the ways in which we actually give God the glory. It would be nice if we got it all right, but look at the history of the church. We really don't. But it's not the end of the world that we've failed. What matters is how we fail. Do we fail in despair or in faith? And the honesty that's demanded of us as Christians and indeed as ministers is about failing in faith. That is, having the trust to face the failure and say, I know that's what I've got to grow from now with God. And that language of convocation reminds us as well of the, the kind of communal aspects of discernment, that this is not something we do in isolation, not even just vertically me and God, but that it's allowing ourselves to be known well enough so that others might speak into that as that's, well. That's absolutely right, yes. Mm. Yes, and it's, it's an ambitious idea of the church, isn't it? But I think it's a, a serious one that we're here to some extent to speak the truth to one another not in the um, rather horrible way of speaking the truth in love, which usually means taking great delight in telling other people what they don't want to hear. Plenty of that around in the church. But genuinely trying to reflect back to others things they might need to discern or see and have enough time and freedom and trust to do that. Uh, well, having spent a number of years across the border uh, uh, ministering and teaching in England, you've, of course, uh, recently returned home to Wales, for which we are all grateful and delighted. Um, but often there's something about leaving one's home that allows us to kind of see where we're from in, in a new light. Um, I'm curious for you, having, having left Wales, coming back to Wales, what have you learned from that experience? Uh, kind of what is your sense of what makes Wales unique? What are the, mm. the unique opportunities uh, facing Wales, but also the unique challenges facing Wales at this time? Hmm. Well, I was relieved when I came back to Wales to find that something of the, the grassroots cooperative political spirit was still alive. Um, a sort of frantic, hectic, managerial stroke entertainment political culture, which overtakes most of the UK, doesn't entirely dominate in Wales. I'm not saying that our political leaders are, are flawless, wise, and virtuous in every respect. But I have had the sense since coming back that there's a bit less idiotic theater about politics in Wales than in Westminster. Um, naming no names. <laughs> and that there is still, let's say, an expectation of accountability to the community, which still really matters. 
When I first came back to Wales in 1992 to be Bishop of Monmouth, I remember having something of the same feeling then, but even more acutely now. And that means when you've got a, a small and quite tight-knit national community, there are things you can work on. There are projects of common concern and vision you can consolidate that, that do seem to me to be more readily done in this kind of society than in the larger environment mm. of England, which I suppose, is, I know you wanted to talk about this, mm. which is something to do with why I've got involved with the um, Independent Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales. <laughs> um, terrific title, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I'm glad you said it. I wasn't sure I'd be able to remember what it was called. That's helpful. Um, and really what that commission is about is not just um, the sort of policy wonk stuff about different kinds of constitutional structure or exactly what devolved powers there might be or what alterations to the fiscal system might be made. We've had some uh, toe-curlingly detailed days discussing some of these things. But at the heart of it is the question, what makes a really healthy democracy? What in Wales, if you like, goes with the grain of that healthy democracy? What's getting in the way? How do we create a political cultural, not just create, but encourage a political culture in Wales that has at its heart principles like accountability and subsidiarity, that is doing things at the right level, and solidarity, an awareness of common purpose, and agency, a democracy in which people feel they have a say and a voice in making a difference. How do we really fatten up that kind of democratic culture? How do we make democracy more than just the occasional cross on the paper or the occasional letter to the MP or local councillor? Uh, there's a quotation that's often attributed to you, though I haven't been able to uh, locate the source. So first I'll have to conform, uh, confirm whether or not you actually said this. Um, but the quotation is that mission is finding out where the spirit of God is at work and joining in. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like something you would say? I, I think I did say Okay, that, good, good. So we're on the right track. Um, what does that look like for you in your own ministry? Can you, as you look back on the, the kind of highlights of your public ministry, are there moments in which you remember God being uh, tangibly present and at work and where you had an opportunity uh, to join into that? The example I've often used here is from when I was a curate. Um, and we were in an, what we're not now supposed to call an interregnum, <laughs> Um, we were between vicars, and the new vicar had been appointed and was about to arrive, and the bishop rang me up and said, um, you probably ought to know, but let's just call him John, the new vicar, um, and his wife have just separated. So there won't be a family moving into the vicarage after all. Um, would you mind telling the PCC? Thank you, Bishop, I said. <laughs> I'd be delighted. So I called a meeting of the church council and explained to them what was happening. And there was a long pause. And one of the um, church wardens, who was an ex-military man and a rather sort of heavyweight character, shook his head and took a deep breath. And I thought, oh, here we go. And he said, well, Rowan, if all this is true, this man's going to need all the help we can give him. Mm. And I felt converted by that. Mm. I felt I, I had expected to have to try and be the sort of um, liberal, generous Christian voice in a group of um, reluctant and rather bigoted parishioners. And I was very firmly slapped down by the grace of God. Mm. That's just one instance. But... I think that the formula about finding where God is and joining in is it's really in a way a, a sort of negative 
principle. Don't imagine that you can walk into situations and supply the absence of God. Oh, there's a situation that needs God. I've got God. Let's take God there. Rather than saying, here is a situation of huge complexity and need. It's exactly the kind of situation where you would expect God to be doing rather a lot of surprising things. So let's try and find out what they are and build. And whether that's in, well, the council estate parishes where I did preordination, placement, and curacy, whether it's in the international life of the church or the life of society as a whole, whether indeed it's in the, um, the work of Christian aid, which I chaired for um, eight years, same principle applies. In Christian aid, we would always say, we don't take a program into a community. We don't go to a developing economy and say, oh, you've got this problem, here's our answer. We look at what people are already doing, wanting, identifying, and then ask, so what can we do really to fill that out with you? And I think it's, it's all the same principle. You expect God to be at work. And your calling is not to let God in, but to let God let you in to what's being done to go on making the kind of difference that matters, I think. A rather big question. I know we're, we're coming to the end of our time together, but um, how do you understand the rather kind of drastic and precipitous decline in, in Christian observance and belief over the last you know, 60, 70 plus years? And, and in particular, do, do you see it primarily as uh, due to external factors, cultural, scientific, intellectual, or is it uh, the failure of the church to offer a compelling vision uh, of our faith? Mm. As you say, it's an enormous question, and the answer has to be, I'd say, very varied. So let me begin at what might be the easier end. For all kinds of reasons, in the last half century especially, we've become much more reluctant as a society to join things. People don't join things in the same way and see their identity as bound up with collectives. I guess a certain number of you are more or less my generation, and so will know what I mean when I say that I grew up in an environment where people joined clubs, associations, political parties, took the same newspaper every morning for 50 years, structured their lives in a way which, if you like, resigned a certain abstract freedom of choice in order to have a sense of belonging, and that that was rather taken for granted. Now, the readership of daily papers, the membership of political parties, the membership of sports clubs, all these things has declined precipitously. It's not entirely surprising in that context if attendance at church declines precipitously as well because we are not a society of joiners any longer. We value autonomy and choice, consumer choice. What kind of coffee do you want? Remember the days when you asked for a cup of coffee and you got a cup of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Whew, that really makes me feel medieval sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, that's what we treasure. Mm. So that's, that's the easy end of it. And that's where, if you like, the church can rather smugly point the finger at society mm. saying, well, it's not just us, is it? Mm. And you know, there were moments when I was archbishop and um, one or other of the, the newspapers would have an article about how I was, I was presiding over the biggest numerical disaster in the history of Christendom. <laughs> and I wanted to say, well, just tell me about your readership again. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Falls of 75% in the readership of your newspaper. Just, just, just saying. <laughs> However, I say I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Pointing the finger. Mm. Um, but moving to the rather difficult and kind of 
self-relating side of it. There has certainly since the 1960s been a growing sense of unease and unconfidence in lots of churches. And that has many complex roots, some of them social, and some of them to do with the church simply not quite holding its nerve in some situations, with the result that it looks fearful and anxious. It's sort of casting around, what's going to make people love us? And that's never a terribly good question mm -hmm. to ask. Um, and as, as time goes on, I think that's got more marked, and it's been intensified by the fact that for the last certainly 25, 30 years, the internal tensions of our church have been very, very visible. They've all been played out in public. Tensions over the ordination of women, tensions over how we treat same-sex relationships, the rising tensions, of course, over the trans issue, but that's another question. But we are a place where these controversies about gender especially are played out very dramatically and sometimes quite, quite violent language. What do people see when they look at the church? Well, very often they see a lot of people being extremely unpleasant to each other. Mm. That's what they see. Mm. And if you put together a lot of people being very unpleasant to each other and a community desperate to be loved, you know, the average person in the street says, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But um, in the words of John, John Cleese's psychiatrists in Forty Towers, well, there's a whole conference to be had about that. <laughs> you know, there's something about, mm. about the psyche, of the collective psyche of the church being in a rather bad place yeah. with all that. And that doesn't help. So, that, before you ask, there is no quick answer to this. <laughs> but at least... A bit of diagnosing of how that sounds and how that looks helps us. And really back to where I started, I think, one of the things that does get us a bit beyond that is a sense in worship and common life, this is supremely worth doing. Don't join us because we've got all the right answers. Don't join us because we, we're doing things perfectly. Join us because what we're doing is life-giving. And if we can look as if we believe that what we're doing is life-giving, that does help a bit, mm. which is why um, worship that conveys confidence, gratitude, the freedom to shout and the freedom to be still, all of that says something about the fact that we are here as Christians, not because we've all decided there shall be a Christian church, and we've all signed up, but because we have been overtaken by a gift and a possibility so extraordinary and so beautiful that however much of a mess we're making, we can't stop coming back to it and reminding people of its depth and its glory. Not long ago, I heard uh, the theologian Jane Williams, who I believe you know uh, very well. I, th I think it was Ben. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> I heard her speak very movingly, but also with great pain about uh, the failure of her generation and, and, and indeed of your generation um, to, to, to hand on their faith to their children. Mm. Um, and this was a, an area of great concern to her and, and something she was spending quite a bit of time thinking uh, and praying about. Um, and so to the, the, the parents, the godparents, the grandparents uh, in, the, in the audience, how can we be doing a better job at forming our children in the life of faith? Mm. Well, Jane Williams is usually right about things, so <laughs> I, uh, I uh, mm. sign up to anything that she says. Mm. How do we make a better job of it? Well, unfashionably, but rather basically, I think it does help to have domestic rituals as best we can, to help children see that prayer is not an eccentricity, 
something people do. It's a matter of introducing young people to persons and stories who will give some sense of the life-giving largeness of Christian identity. Now, none of that guarantees that your children will keep coming to church on Sunday morning, um, especially in their teenage years when Sunday morning is a somewhat theoretical idea for most <laughs> teenagers. But if it can be conveyed, those, those two things are worth thinking about. The routines of domestic prayer in the Christian year are not eccentricities. People do them. And that these are life-giving. I think that makes a bit of a difference. Mm. And one more personal memory, if I may. Somebody who, who was hugely important to me for many, many years was the late Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, the Russian Orthodox Archbishop, whose little books on prayer I began to read as a teenager and went on reading and still read, and who was a teacher and a presence and a personality, was one of the great Christian figures of 20th century Britain. Um, Father Anthony died 20 years ago, I think 20 years ago this summer, actually. And about six weeks before he died, he came to dinner with us. <clears throat> and I, I remember asking him how he was. We knew he had cancer. We knew this might be the last time. And I remember he said, well, the doctor says, um, if I'm lucky, six weeks. If I'm unlucky, six months. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, I think we both knew this probably was the last time we'd meet. And I thought, well, let's try it. So our son then was quite, um, quite young. I think he must have been about eight, eight or nine. And he'd gone to bed. And I went and woke him and said, you must come and meet somebody. So I took him downstairs to meet Father Anthony. And I said to him afterwards, I just want you to remember when you grow up, that you met Anthony Bloom, and you, you, you touched the hand of somebody who is one of the reasons why I think Christianity is worthwhile. Mm. And in one way or another, literally or metaphorically, I think that's what we can do. We can mm. introduce people to mm. those who give us the sense that it's worthwhile. Mm. And does he remember? Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, he, uh, he likes to reel off the fact that he at Lambeth Palace, he met Anthony Bloom and the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, <laughs> <laughs> all of whom have done their bit for him. Mm. Uh, final question. So we, we've talked a bit about the challenges. We've talked a bit about um, uh, the opportunities facing the church. Looking back on your own ministry, uh, what gives you hope for the future of the church uh, in this country? The sheer fidelity of people in parishes. No two ways about it. Um, when I was Archbishop, the greatest joy was weekends in Canterbury. When I could go for a Sunday morning to a, an ordinary parish in Kent and be made aware that whatever was in the Daily Mail <laughs> and whatever had happened at some awful meeting of Anglican primates the week before, actually, God's children in Kent were getting on with getting to know God better and serving one another and loving their neighbours. End of story, really. Mm. And I, I think that's the greatest privilege, in fact, that a bishop has. Mm. I, I think God in his mercy has provided that bishops spend a bit of time visiting parishes so that they will not despair. Mm. And even in retirement, I've been so privileged to, to have some little share in pastoral work in this diocese, and I'm just constantly overwhelmed and delighted by the fact that the grace of God keeps at it mm. in the fidelity of people in the parishes. And for all the, the change and upheaval around that 
for all the uncertainty and the awful pressure that is piled on people in so many ways, they still do it. It's wonderful. Mm. Hope well, enough there. Well, Rowan, I think that is a, a wonderfully um, a hopeful note to end our evening on. You have been uh, immensely generous with your time today. I had about 15 more questions, which sadly we weren't able to get to. Uh, so next time we have a Clandaff Festival, we'll make sure we'll get you back uh, uh, for the remainder. Um, but you've given us uh, plenty to think on and, and, and to discuss over drinks after. I, I believe the bar will be open at the end if, if people want to stay around uh, for some drinks. But would you please join me in thanking Bishop Rowan. Thank you.